Hello, sunshines, and welcome to Devaliant to Plays Inverness Nights by Kitsubasa. This visual novel was part of Ichio's bundle for racial justice and equality. In this queer, supernatural historical fiction, you are introduced to Tristram, a simple tailor just trying to survive, hiding his true feelings and his special powers in 1700 Inverness, Scotland. Warning, this video features homophobia, graphic imagery, and depictions of abuse. Discretion is advised. Now, without further ado, let's get started. A knock comes when my elbow deep in petticoat. <laughs> wow. I've got my hands full. There's no lock. I hope you're excited. The robe fabric is lower grade, but just as old. Oh, look what you've done. I didn't think you'd be able to center the designs on the scallops. Then why add her that to her specifications? I want to check the fit before I start attaching the frills and the trim. Right, a moment to take this off. I'll leave the fabric by the armchair. I don't want to interrupt you while you're concentrating. Yet you are, anyway. Yeah, you are, anyway. <laughs> but you're frowning. Yes. Is something wrong? No. Nothing new. You haven't mentioned any problems. As long as the fit is off. Can you shut it about the fit? Can you shut it about the fit? <laughs> I had shut it. You're the one who pried it back open. I thought you'd let it go. Please. Please let it go. She stares as though I've robbed her of her ability to blink, eyes perfectly still. I pick up the roll of fabric she brought in with her. I walk it over to the dress form and start experimenting, checking, weight, drape, weave. She remains stuck in place. She'd be a flawless, flawless dress form for herself. Shall I continue the story? If you're mad at me, better to leave for the day. Are you going to keep pushing my boundaries? No. Then why do I need to leave? Why would you want to stay? Don't you want to keep listening? Is the story even for my benefit? She pulls her pink petticoat back around her waist and takes a melodramatic breath. The trio near the port of Thessalonica, Thessalonica, the first major destination within Greece, well westward of the Constantinople, but still shadowed beneath it, Fairy Mariana and Sinbad sailed through a gloomy day, gloomier than the Mediterranean should ever be. The gloomy, in fact, so gloomy, in fact, the weather was better described as a storm. The wind whipped at the ship, battering it over the waves, back and forth and back and forth, slanting long crests and sinking into the crevices beneath between them. Mariana was shaken to the point of sickness. Fury and Simon were Sinbad were beaten and exhausted, trying to keep their little vessel under control. The shore finally rose from the sea. The branching brown fingers of the docks were an inviting sight. Sinbad took their invitation too early. His fashionable silk slippers were crafted for social traction, not the functional kind. Slipping along the deck, he failed for a hold. The rigging, while happy to catch those who didn't want to be caught, seemed to be writhed in his hands. At hip height, the bulwark was also unhelpful. Performing a neat flip into the water, Sinbad disappeared. A five-second splash of red in the wave dragged in the opposite direction of the boat. Fury yelled and made to catch him, but even... In a flat bottom vessel, the reach was f too far, too late. Steering needed to be done. Mariano was strong, but storms needed technique to sail. He returned to the tiller, lower than the wind had demanded. The boat dragged into the do into dock, far from sunk, but with a snapped mast, frayed lashings on the quarter rudder, torn sails, and missing slats across the deck and bulwark. Bluster and downpour easing, Mariana and Fury weighed anchor and hurried inland. Sodden to the spirit, they dripped through the, the door of a local inn. Neither was in the mood for haggling. They paid four more coins than the room was worth. 
As they set to bed, Mariana jostled under her blanket. We should have stopped. A bolt of lightning clattered across the wind outside the window. Fairy's eyes were lit, and they held the glow some moments longer than the sky. Sinbad isn't made for paper, I'm sure. Isn't made of paper, I'm sure. His eyes flared without any help from the weather. I'm sure he'll be fine. Do you like secrets? Everyone likes secrets. Fury liked spilling them in particular. Before Mariana could formally affirm her interest, he tipped the contents of his mind out through his mouth. We've been together for 200 years, and we've always survived these things, so he'll be okay. If Sinbad wasn't, Fury would tip himself into the ocean, as flippant as his life as he, with his life as he was with his privacy. The next day, they walked to the docks. Someone's god had mercifully tamed the tides, and the cog was set on flat water. After taking stock of the damage, Fury made, a made to town and acquired repair supplies. They were about to fix work by lunchtime. They were about to fix work by lunchtime. Mariana stitching the sail into a full sheet while Fury organized the new mast. The sun set, taking their energy with it. No sign of Sinbad. There was more to fix. They could wait for him. On the second day, Fury fitted replacement slats while Mariana checked food and cargo were intact. Each of Fury's hammer strikes contained 500 years of nautical experience. Faster, cleaner, better than the career carpenters. The wood mismatched the original planks, but the skill of Fury's handiwork made it less of a defect and more of a character trait. In the afternoon, they went to Thessalonica's marketplace and traded for a leaf of castor and pollux. It gave them another hour of productivity, banging it into place with above the cabin door. Procrastination is harder to decry when it involves work. There was an hour of sunlight left. Ah, oh, cute. Fairy and Mariana sat on the end of the dock. With the ocean so flat, any movement on it should have been invisible. There were gulls above. There were fish and cephalopods below. There was nothing between, no creature or criminal in the median. The only castaway from the storm was a grey cloud, splaying across the sky. When the stars came out, they went in. Heh. <laughs> No weather, no waves, no footsteps in the dark. Fairy spoke in a whisper. I don't think he's coming back. Mariana, Mariana allowed the thought to slip by. I heard there are Byzantine forces arriving in... I heard there are Byzantine forces arriving here in two days. Fairy's concerned voice. Concerns voice. He rolled over and closed his eyes. The rain began again. Mariana counted lightning strikes until she reached sleep. The third day, they boarded the cog. Mariana had to be taught how to hoist the anchor and lower the sails. Yanking too hard, she detached a few lines of the rigging. An hour had to be spared instructing her on how to retie them. Thessalonica, Thessaloniki pressured the departure with the weight of boredom. Mariana finally understood the knots. Maybe they could l lose the rudder? Before the pair could create a new delay, impractically gentle footsteps padded behind them. His jacket held on to some of the water. His hair was messy. His pants had sunk. His eyes were buoyed with happiness. You waited, he said. We had repairs keeping us. Fury embraced him tighter than any ocean could and hauled him aboard. What's your excuse? I came ashore miles off. I had to walk in the rain. I'm famished. By Mariana's checklist, they left for Athens, with all the cargo in its place. Two dozen soldiers took the t town behind them and made their way to the portside inn. Aquila was asked ostensibly there in broader Latin hunting duties, but he had to ask, Have you seen a woman in blue and gold accompanied by two men? One would be Persian. The innkeeper advised she was with a single man, and he was Italian. Aquila struck the table triumphantly, imagining what dagger had been driven into the Persian, pretending to plunge it himself. They were bound for Athens. He would gain permission, and a ship, and he would be bound there too. 
Another premature ending. Are you coming back tomorrow? I assumed I would be. Well, uh, the fitting is done. You said you have to substitute some trims, don't you? I did. May I see them tomorrow? I can't think of a reasonable objection. Fantastic. Why so insistent on visiting again? Good afternoon, then. I'm excited to see what you'll offer in the morning. She reaches for the door. I reach for her. Let go of my arm. What's the point of the story? Measure me, fine, but I prefer you don't touch me. It's as though I'm clutching ice. The shafts of bone beneath my hand are too close and the flesh too cold. Tristan, why are you so cold? Would you let go? I obey. You weren't supposed to do that. Not yet. Another one of her exaggerated breaths. I've never seen her taking any other kind. Ask tomorrow. The door closes. Shell is gone. I walk through the night to the morning and its questions. She knocks as a courtesy. The door swings open. Her limbs are loose and her head is hanging. It takes a moment, her a moment to string herself into composure. Beautiful. <laughs> Strange. Thank you. Compliments make these blisters worthwhile. Your fingers weren't callous before. <laughs> the details require a small needle than my norm. Different stress on my skin. I'd apologize for saddling you with such an odd job, but I figure I'm paying too much for that. <laughs> Why tailoring, anyhow? Not the profession I'd see you in if I saw you on the street. Due to my size. <laughs> Most tailors aren't so sturdy. <laughs> Not in England, no. Half our men have muscles left over from fighting. That's what you did? What? Fighting? Yes. You'll be unsurprised to learn that I was fighting for the Jacobites. You're right, I'm unsurprised. <laughs> you might she might have been surprised if I'd been honest. Mentioned last year, last war, I predated predated the Jacobean era, though it marched the same paces and places as the leader conflicts. Our battles turned proverbially south, as favor turned to the literal south. I wanted a safer career. With her economy so unstable, the best line of work was one people would always need. No love for sewing? I like it enough. You learn drafting, draping, and mantua making just because you sell money in it? Given how much you've paid, would that be so wrong? <laughs> as long as it makes you happy. Happy. Hmm. Discussing my work with someone so wealthy is pointless pursuit. Is it? Pleasure is easy to purchase and hard to earn stern words. I am a stern man. Dismiss me if you want, but I haven't always had money. You're scattering solid gold for costumes. It may be a recent education, but I dare say you've learnt about buying happiness. Happiness? I'm buying clothes. That in mind, why do you need this robe? It's none of your business. What if I need to know for business purposes? Tristan. Shell. I won't push so hard as to be unprofessional, but given I'm risking my life for you, a little more information. You undersold the importance of your trip. I'll turn my linings if you turn yours. She sweeps toward the corner, corner, her skirts seep underneath the furniture as she passes. Sinking her weight onto one side of the armchair, her attention makes land on my window frame. I don't know who I was before last week. 
I stuttered when I said my name because I don't have a real answer. My shoes are broken, my petticoats unraveling, and plenty of mishaps could have brought me here. You're amnesiac. Maybe. Do you have any sus suspicions? About who I am? She stands, turns, and walks back to me. Each joint moves with slight delay, as if she were viewing the sequence as she cues it. I could be a courtesan, dressed for a high-class customers. Then how did the gold come about? Overpayment from a client? Underpayment? Londoners have too much money. You don't think I'm worth it? I don't want to think about that. <laughs> what other possibilities have you considered? Maybe I'm just rich. You'd be quite a tan for nobility. Perhaps the real reason you're a tailor is that you can't open your mouth around women without offending them. The fashion is to be pale. The fashion is what you make it. Isn't that the point of your job? My job is to continue trends, not craft new ones. Charming. My last idea is that I'm a thief. It's my favorite option. An interesting preference. Favor is exciting. You pick the right pockets, it's, in, it's justice too. You want to be Robin Hood. Someone along those lines. Taking from the rich, giving to the poor. You're succeeding at that already. Oh, that was him. Taking from the rich, giving to the poor. You're succeeding at that already. Exactly. What took your memory then? What indeed? I can tell you I walk on a table. I dressed, I ran. I met the people who directed me north. They had business in the highlands and no one to handle it. You have a lot of leisure time for someone on business. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> tell me, which potential life would you bank on? Um... Ooh. I mean, she wants to be a thief, right? But also being a courtesan would be... You are... You are a thief. You made it. Why wouldn't I? It could be flattery. You have a lot of respect for thieves, and normally dislike of their work is what stops people becoming them. Also, you're a recent amnesiac, yet you have this fortune. Assuming you didn't wake with it, how did you amass it so quickly? Thank you. Why? For listening to me. Your story is giving me plenty of practice. Is it fury you insp you aspire to? Yes. I'm not that bold. If you were, you'd have your textile worker. You're offering to be my Mariana. I'm saying I understand her. Well, that aside, we've laid out my background. What about yours? We've discussed my career thoroughly. Why do you need to run? How to answer? Perhaps with as much honesty as she used. Someone is threatening to have me arrested. She tilts her head forward, hair curtaining her features as though she's a priest in a confessional. Do they have a reason? Does Alistair... By his reckoning, I have committed a crime. But not by yours. Are you frightened? <laughs> if you wanted to steal my money, you could have left the first night. My crime was not taking coin. What was it? Why is it subjective? Do you consider yourself judgmental or pious? I don't judge. By regular standards or religious ones. Her eyes darted down her body, her she clutches her hands over her neckline, fingertips digging into her collarbone. Her fear recedes inward. I try not to judge. I'm planning to leave town anyway. I have the funds. Nothing to lose. Trust to gain. 
He's accusing me of sodomizing him. I guess the question isn't whether or not you did. Does it bother you? No. I advance on her to ensure her response wasn't contorted by the distance. No. I have no issue with you being that way inclined. <laughs> Why not? Her eyes are still. The moment is remote, her thoughts stuck in her stories, lost some hundreds of years ago. She loosens again, flooding with modern life. Because men are wonderful. You were going to show me some trends, weren't you? She pushed for that conversation, to see it abandoned so quickly. Was she repulsed after all? I was. Shall I grab them for you? Please. Over to the cupboard where I keep my secret, my sheets of samples where I keep my secrets. Whenever I buy a new trim, I clip a section off and sew it into the canvas sheet. I fill each sheet with perhaps a dozen trims before starting anew. The links stay coiled in another cupboard. The less I touch them, the better. Avoids them tangling into inscrutable balls of color and clash. I take out four sheets and leave the fifth behind. All the trims on it are running too low, too old to purchase new segments of. Pattern trims are skipped these days. Plain trims can be dyed and replicated. Brocade, tulips, and bias cut taut and harder to repeat. Here we are. Thank you. Picking up the first sheet, she skims a finger over the offerings, moves on to the next. Her face is blank until the third sheet. Her finger settles on a silk ribbon that is repeating teal and green triangle design. This would work, wouldn't it? I have some plain trims that run a similar color. Uh, I'll pair them together. I return to the cupboard to find them. There's an uncertain noise. Does it make you anxious, knowing he wants you dead? I saw the case. You saw the case I packed. Were you together? Four years. Why now? We had to fight. I'm sorry. He was a stubborn, insufferable man. Circumcised, conspired. Sir <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> Boy, I'm not reading good today. Circumstance conspired. There we were. No hope for amends. He would have visited. I retrieve a figure eight coil of lime trim, made some months ago for a commissioned frock coat. I saved his life when he was adamant he no longer wanted it. Sailors who hauled anchors above their weight drown with them. The trims match like I hoped. I'm going to resume work. Do you want to tell your story? Grab your tools. We'll get going. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for explaining. The sun lurched from under the clouds, dimmer than they had remembered it. The city of Athens was equally disappointing. Fury trudged through the muddy streets, deflecting most attempts at conversation. I hate coming here. There's more decay every time, he eventually said. With the remaining coin in pocket, they hunted for a ha haberdasher. If they may die, sewing embellishments in available to Mariana, they could resell the fabric in less conspicuous forms than the current bolts. The market, the Agora, Vera insisted, feigned life. People, traders, just enough activity to call it a crowd. Supplies were easy to find. So was an alley of gambling brigands. Fairy's focus flicked from die to die as he moved toward them. One stood to warn him away, only to warn him instead, smiling as he saw his face. Porphyrius! Ah, you haven't aged a day! I'd say the same, but I can't see your face under that beard, Luciano. What a place to meet. I'm returning to Venice in a few months. Mariana had stalled at the mouth of the alley, 
with Fury disappearing down the throat, slapping backs and whooping at bad rules. She was wary of intruding. Hello. Speaking of which, Sinbad sidled over to her and settled a hand on her arm. He usually finds some person or another. Best practice is to let him be. Curling his fingers to into her sleeve, he gave it a tug. I prefer to be somewhat calmer. Leaving the heart of the city for one of its blue-tinged arteries, the pair found a quiet patch of grass. The ground was damp, but with so many layers of clothing it didn't bother them. Small walls of chipped marble surrounded their resting place. This was more to Mariana's liking. She breathed sharply. Is something wrong? Sinbad asked. There are questions I want to ask Fury. I don't think he'd answer them. Sinbad smiled and leaned back against one of the walls. He closed his eyes and folded his arms, forming a comfortable cocoon. I'll explain as best I can. She breathed slow. Why take me with you? I know I asked. Why go along with it? Fairy isn't picky. It's more interesting to say yes. Sole time he denied passage was a Roman friend prone to mutiny. Why wasn't he worried about you until two days after you went overboard? Believe this or not, and I won't be offended if you choose not, Fury and I aren't normal people. Theft and adventuring aside, we're immortals, sort of. Of a sort. Witches? Nothing that bad. I couldn't explain to you why we are who we are, how we are, but we are. So we try to make it interesting. Of course, his idea of interesting involves more heist than mine. Do you dislike his extravagance? <laughs> no. It's what I love most, and he needs someone to temper it for practicality. I do that. I handle the rigging, I keep the books balanced and the maps dry. We sail happily. Was breaking into my work your idea or his? Mine, initially. I thought it'd be profitable. We were close to broke, Constantinople, all those trading restrictions. I didn't expect anyone to be there. Her questions continued on until finally she was interrogating Sinbad about the countries he'd seen and the other immortals he met. A Maghribi pirate who had committed her life to the accumulation of coin and succeeded such that she could buy out mana nation, minor nations where she and Tristan in spending it. A Syrian historian convinced he held divine right to rule the world. An Azerbaijani Bajani bureaucrat convinced he needed paperwork to prove it. A Moroccan adventurer on a quest to see every great ancient building, his charcoal artist sister sketching each expedition. A whole pantheon of characters set to live forever. Mariana's cries grew wider with each story until she asked, If you were going to live forever, why waste effort on fabric? Fury agreed to take it because it was voluble. I asked to take it because, at the outset of everything, I was a silk trader, as were my father and grandfather and so on. Fabric is a constant. I started with it. I discovered my immortality and now I have to keep working with it to make sure I don't go mad with homesickness. Why not return to Persia? It's nostalgia for a time rather than love of a place, especially with my faith and my trade absent from its current cur cultural climate. No, I'll keep doing this until the day I die. Maybe even after. When I'm dead, I want Fury to take my body to where the vultures are, lying in the heat, flesh bitten ap apart and burnt hard, until finally there's nothing to me but blood and bones and a leather lack bag of sickened. That's when I will set this work behind me. I thought you were immortal. As I said, of a sort. We have friends who've died from wounds or starvation or drowning. We don't get sick or old, but we certainly die. In all the least pleasant ways. You have an exit. Precisely. And what we lack in resistance to wound and asphyxiation, we make up for in other ways. Most of us, at least. Oh? I have no clue if he's mentioned it, but Fury is able to heal bleeding and broken bones. It's quite fun to watch. He waves his hands, and they're good as new. 
Our friends can do other party tricks. The Azerbaijani can freeze things at his touch. And the Moroccan duo can control flames. What about you? I can't do anything yet. Some figure it out, some don't. I'm not fussed. He stood, grass stains on his coat and trousers. Fear he could only have so many things to say to his countrymen, and they could only toler could only tolerate him for so long. Mariana took the tent and eased to her feet. She walked along Sid alongside Sinbad, her features softer than usual. Granted, this was the same step in hardness of a sapphire to Topaz. Her lips fished open to shut with the questions formed and discarded. Sinbad's expression was a mix of frustration and contemplation. He held his hands at chest height and peered into them. He wasn't a palm reader. Attempts at finding the future in them were futile. Fury was in the alley where they had left him. At his side, a bolt of silk. The silk they had intended to leave on the ship. Why is that there? Mariana asked. He winked past her to Sinbad. To the spirit of camaraderie, of begging for forgiveness when asking for permission from a six-foot woman is too daunting. The dice left his hand and toppled across the pavestones. Another bad flow, Fury. Best get a second length of that silk. Mariana's face blanched wider than a diamond. She grabbed Fury by the neck of his overshirt and hauled him to his feet. We're leaving! No! Beard again replied, getting up from his seat. Perfurious had his throw. It's gone bad. Sidbad and I didn't agree to this, Mariana continued her stride. Perfurious did. If you think we care what you agree to, well, Beard beckoned to his cohorts. They rose, leaving two seated with the prize, prizes and the dice. Snake eyes. Sinbad read the pair of dots, read the blade Beard was close to brandishing, and snatched Mariana's hand. The trio launched into a bustle of the crowd, Beard and company shortly behind them. Within moments, shoppers filled the gap between the two parties, buying Mariana, Fury, and Sinbad time to step up their sprint. It didn't take long for the human obstacle course to dissipate. When it did, the brigands were no longer visible. The stones alternated to to mud back stones to mud and back with every meter they moved from the city market they would have to watch their footing the trio pulled a tight corner weaving through the rundown alleys how far to port mariana had hitched up her skirts to sprint her footsteps were solid and certain if we keep this pace 15 20 minutes have we lost them we can slow down if you want fairy fury's toes caught in his billowing trousers he stumbled and regained his balance. I can't see them anymore. So, the tip of Sinbad's shoes dug into the mud. His other foot, unable to balance, slid out behind him. He flopped forward like a puppet with cut strings. Muck oozed in the cre creases of his face. He writhed, caught between two twin urges to panic and stand. Mariana bent and offered her arm as a climbing tool. Sinbad accepted. Stabilizing, he pulled off his shoes and threw them over his shoulders. Twice is enough! The sprint picked up again. Twenty minutes, as per Fairy's guess, uneventful, but further mistakes from Sin no further mistakes from Sinbad, no intrusions from Beer and the band. Still, arriving at the Paris, they wasted no time weighing anchor and setting for sea. Some towns died honorable deaths, others became ghouls. Athens had clung to life too long. Fairy. Fury would. Uh, would have advocated running one way or another. Hours later, as the afternoon sky shuffled its curtains here together, a cluster of soldiers entered Athens. It seemed an innocuous thing to ask men of the law for their help enforcing it. Beard kept to one of the visiting soldiers, a slight one in red and blue. He waved a shoe in his face to get attention. You seen any Persians running barefoot owes me a debt. Got a Venetian and some lady with him. Akila caught the shoe from the beard's hand and crushed it in its grip. The Persian is alive. Bad. They've been here. Good. You were chasing them? Yeah. How long ago? About noon. Where to? Out of town, suppose. Port, maybe? They'll be back on the water, looking for rest. I'll fight them. 
I can't promise their cargo, but I can promise retribution. Beard nodded, spine prickling. This was far more for more than forcing Fury to honor his monetary dues. Thank you for your information, Sailor. I suppose I'll be headed offshore again. Aguila tilted his head to side to side, the bones of his neck crunching. Offshore, yes. Offshore to Salamis Island. Shell. Yes. You say the story explains how you got the silk. I suppose it's factual. Is everything about theory true as well? You're listening. Can I have an answer? <laughs> it's real. His hands would glow pink. Any damaged skin between them would weave together. Actually, I have a confession. I thought you were excited to discuss the story. We need to discuss me now. You asked why I was so set on telling this tale. It's because I think you have the same skills as Fiery, Fury. 775 years. The only people who knew were people I told. One day someone had to figure it out independently. I was afraid this moment would arise from a witch hunt. I was afraid I need to deny it. I instead, I lift my hands to hers. A white light fills the space between them. A pallor I never considered eases from the surface of her skin. A waxy film lifts from her eyes. She chokes and lurches away. Her fingers curl into her necklace, slide to her chest press against the space between her breasts. Wait for a beat. She holds her palms in front of her. I had only intended to show her the glow. You're real. He was right. How did you find out? After Colliton, a noble met a tailor at the crossroad, sat beside a pile of bodies. The tailor required help retrieving one. It had soapy skin and a face full of maggots, but the tailor repaired it. He went his way, and so did the noble. The noble told his family the story. They told their friends. Somebody told me. Why play coy? Imagine someone walking in from the street and asking if you're a witch. Why do you care? You're young? You're healthy? <laughs> Am I? Give me a real answer. I've gotten ahead of myself. I have to go. Keep walking. I'll be here tomorrow. She slams the door. Her feet tap the steps. The street swallows them. Into my armchair I topple. It would be easier if the holes were opened and each other's claims leaked. Like Sinbad's perfurious, 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 like a boat at the bottom of the ocean. Aquila advances consistently enough that the trio are doomed to confrontation. Confrontations with higher powers never end clean. Am I alone? Shell said Sinbad said there were others. Claims twice removed. What if I was wasting my time in this country? On this island far from the world. Should I have gone offshore? Thank you for joining me as I played Inverness Nights by Kitsubasa. The new episode will be out shortly. If you enjoyed what you saw, please leave a like, a follow, and ring that notification bell so you know when the new episode drops. Also, don't forget to check out the link to the completely free Discord server to chat about games and whatever else is on your mind. Let's keep the comments chill, so no hate or spoilers, as I'm not above removing those comments and the people who make them. That's all for now, folks. And I'll see you next time.